When you think of long-clawed theropods, your first thought without a doubt would have been the Therizinosaurus. However, there was another biped which walked the same region at the same time, being known as the terrible hand Dinocarus morificus. In 1965, Polish paleontologist Sofia Jaworowska discovered this dinosaur. Initially, Dinocarus was challenging to classify due to the limited remains, specifically forelimbs, vertebrae, and ribs. This led researchers to place it in a new family dedicated to itself, being known as Dinocaridae. This was then placed with the Incarnosauria. However, subsequent studies suggested that Dinocaris was an Ornithomimosaurian, showing traits such as recurved claws and specific bone ratios. An in-depth 2014 study's goal was to better understand this dinosaur and its group, and they utilized better preserved specimens which helped to redefine the clade Dinocaridae. This led to the conclusion that there was a divergence between its family and the family Ornithomimidae. Dinocaris' family was observed to be more advanced with its features, yet were not built for speed, diverging from the faster Ornithomimidae. The group lived between 116 to 69 million years ago, which include the Bashalong living from 115 to 100 million years ago, the Garudamimus living from 98 to 83 million years ago, and Dinocaris living from 71 to 69 million years ago. There are further discoveries being made of the group and possible entries, but overall these are the most concrete species. Dinocaris lived during the late Cretaceous period, specifically around 71 to 69 million years ago. It was discovered in the Namek Formation of Mongolia, which provided key insights into its habitat. The environment of this formation during the time of Dinocaris was diverse and richly vegetated, characterized by semi-arid climates with distinct wet and dry seasons. This region included river channels, lakes, floodplains, swamps, suggesting a varied landscape that could harbor a wide range of dinosaur species. There is the general consensus that Dinocaris likely inhabited water sources, particularly swamp or marshy environments. It was well suited for terrestrial and aquatic environments, such as shallow waters, where you could use its long arms to dig or gather vegetation. I mean, it seems like this dinosaur was the kingpin of the waterways. As for size, Dinocaris was no joke, being one of the largest theropods to have ever walked the planet. The most reliable estimates place it at around 11 meters in length and over 3 meters at the hips. Its higher weights are a bit debated, but it most confidently sits above the 5 ton range, with other studies placing it at 6.5 tons and 7 tons. This massive size would have been vital for protecting itself, especially considering the lack of speed. Now, there have been certain estimates which have placed this giant at around the 8 ton mark, but the ones that I found have seemed to be a bit outdated, and this doesn't necessarily mean it couldn't reach these sizes, only we need more reliable evidence or more recent studies to support this. Similarly to Therizinosaurus, one of the most notable features of this dinosaur would be those freakishly large limbs and claws. Its forelimbs measured around 2.4 meters in length. That is right, its forelimbs alone were larger than you from head to toe. Its recurved claws even reached 8 inches in length, which yes, is a fair bit smaller than the 1 meter Therizinosaur claws, but I would argue that their claws were far more functional. You might be wondering why that would be. So, let me explain. Its forelimb design is being noted to be similar to the early Therizinosaur known as Axlosaurus. In a 2023 study, researchers tested the capacity of stress for Therizinosaur claws. It turned out that Therizinosaurus couldn't in fact sustain a lot of pressure without breaking, and hence they weren't too functional for certain tasks such as fighting. However, its early ancestors such as Axlosaurus performed quite well when it came to piercing, pulling, and digging. As anatomically speaking, Dinocaris' limbs were quite similarly built to Axlosaurus, but on a much larger scale. We can use it as a foundation to argue that its forelimbs and claws were able to take a good amount of stress and hence made them highly functional whether for foraging, mating, or defense purposes. Now, I won't pretend like this reasoning is perfect, but to support this, there's been numerous researchers that agree that Dinocaris' claws, though blunt, would make functional tools for both defense as well as assisting its dietary needs. We also can't ignore its skull, which let's be honest, it's pretty much shaped just like a duck's, except it's one meter long. The muscle attachments which work to open and close its jaws were quite small in comparison to its body, which does support the idea that he had a relatively weak bite. This shouldn't be overly surprising as comparing this oversized duck skull to nearly any other theropod shows they weren't delivering the most powerful bite. I mean, come on, Dinocaris didn't even have teeth. Although different, this skull structure was useful in a different sense. The broad flattened beak would have been effective for cropping and stripping vegetation, especially in bodies of water. This would include leaves, aquatic plants, and possibly fruit or seeds. Although not the strongest jaws in the world, it did provide Dinocaris flexibility when it came to its diet. Another striking feature of this giant would have to be that massive hump. The neural spines of Dinocaris were notably elongated, creating a stiffened vertebral column through interconnecting ligaments. This structural reinforcement was essentially for supporting the dinosaur's large abdomen and 
distributing mechanical stress to the hips and hind limbs, which was crucial for keeping balance and stability. These spines formed a tall sail along the animal's back, which might have served multiple purposes, such as thermoregulation and visual display for attracting mates or intimidating rivals. I mean, either way you look at it, you can't tell me that there isn't a similarity between this sail as well as the Spinosaurus sail. Coincidences of evolution. We often see that Dinocaris is depicted as completely feathered, but why is that? This comes from the fact that at the end of the vertebrae, the bones were fused together, making it pugger style like. This is observed in modern day birds, which acts as an attachment point for feathers. Also, due to the fact that it's part of the ornithomimosaur clade, you could apply phylogenetics and conclude that since the members of this group possessed feathers, then it's likely that Dinocaris did as well. My issue with this is that while yes, this does indicate that they were feathered at the tip of the tail, it doesn't so much act as concrete evidence to support complete feather covering. Maybe they had sparse feathering all over. Maybe it was just the tail. We just don't know for sure yet. For Further supporting this point, paleontologist and illustrator Mark P. Winton believes that the addition of these layers of so-called fuzz may be overkill for these giant animals. I mean, you don't see African or Asian elephants completely covered in fur like the mammoths of the past. As for this giant's diet, it wasn't as strict as some people may have thought, as it turns out it wasn't a full-on herbivore. While yes, it was adapted for munching down on aquatic vegetation, that wasn't all. Inside of a specimen's stomach, over 1400 gastroliths were discovered. If you're wondering what in the world is a gastrolith, well, they're stomach stones. In the modern day, we see herbivores eat stones to assist in grinding down the food that they are unable to. The same may have been for Dinocaris. However, what's most interesting about this isn't necessarily the stone, but rather the other stomach content discovered. This included vertebrates as well as scales of fish. As it's been suggested they dwelled around water sources, it makes sense for fish to be part of the diet. The arrow supports that Dinocaris did indeed live in or around the water, as fish weren't just growing legs and walking deep into the forest to get eaten by a giant duck. Also, as they're part of the Ornithomimus or clade, which consisted of omnivores, it again makes sense for some meat to be part of their diet. But just because they ate some types of meat doesn't mean that they were competing with the other large theropods for big game. Instead, they would have fed on small animals that were in or around their bodies of water. Still, it is interesting to think that a mega theropod wasn't mainly consuming meat, but rather vegetation. As for competition, Dinocaris was clearly built to be a dominant animal. Yet that doesn't mean there weren't any other herbivores which may have caused issues. For the aquatic world, I think Dinocaris was relatively uncontested. But when it came to the terrestrial vegetation, I think that's where there could have been some contentions. With how similarly built they were, shouldn't come as a surprise that Therizinosaurus was an expected competitor. Although I think that Dinocaris would have the advantage in this matchup due to the latest studies suggesting that the Therizinosaurus's claws weren't nearly as effective as previously thought, especially in a confrontation. Other competitors for vegetation would include hadrosaurs such as Saurolophus and sauropods such as titanosaurs. I mean hadrosaurs, I feel like Dinocaris could deal with that, but when it came to the sauropods, I'm sure it wasn't dumb enough nor aggressive enough to have full-on confrontations with them. Also, as with most animals, other Dinocaris Dinocarises would have been competition to each other. Despite the certainty of some competition, I think that Dinocaris seeming preference for aquatic vegetation and vertebrates meant that beef with other herbivores would be kept to a minimum unless during drought or territorial disputes. As for predators, their size practically made them resistant to most forms of predation. He would be most. There was still the apex predator, T-Rex's Asian relative known as Tarbosaurus. This carnivore was at the top of its ecosystem and not even Dinocaris' size could keep it protected forever. Tarbosaurus grew around 11 meters meters from head to tail, 3 meters from foot to hip, and it also came around 4 to 5 tons in weight, so it certainly seems that Peking Duck was on the menu. Further supporting this includes the discovered damaged fossil remains of Dinocaris, which indicated predation in the form of either hunting or scavenging. You might be surprised to hear that no, it wasn't Barney the dinosaur, but rather a Tarbosaurus. The serrations measured around 0.5 millimeters in diameter, and the other tooth marks left on the bone showed that it was too large for other theropods such as Troodon or Therizinosaurus to be the culprit. Instead, it supports that Tarbosaurus did in fact have the capability to hunt these giants. Paleontologists are confident that their confrontation would be predator-prey related rather than based on aggression due to Tarbosaurus seemingly targeting the organs. So, do I think our duck-billed giant stood zero chance against this predator? Well, of course not. Their massive size, in addition to the fact that they were adapted for shallow-based aquatic environments, makes me think that they would not be at the top of the Tarbosaurus's menu. This is just a theory, but hey, Dinocaris may have used water sources to gain an environmental advantage when being hunted by Tarbosaurus. They could splay their claws out, and I think unless a Tarbosaurus was desperate, it wouldn't dive headfirst into an environment it wasn't entirely comfortable with. However, claws really outdo the classic teeth-jaw combo, and I think that this was the case here. Additionally, its neck was very open and vulnerable, meaning that there was a vital area for Tarbosaurus to target if it got close enough. 
but as with every magnificent giant, their time eventually came to an end. Yet due to the limited remains that we have of this theropod, it is a bit more difficult to pinpoint the exact reason for extinction. The best explanation would have to be a shift in environments. The reason for this is because we know that in Mongolia during the Cretaceous period, the region became subject to severe droughts. Now, the occasional drought is an issue for most animals, but then if you have a species that relies on water for a proportion of its diet, territory, and possibly defense, then that species will suffer significantly, especially if those droughts are reoccurring. So it's very well possible that constant droughts may have driven our giant fluffy duck to extinction. Yet, I think what's even more sad is how underrated this dinosaur has become in recent times, being overshadowed by others such as the Therizinosaurus. Luckily, prehistoric planet did shine a bit of a spotlight on it, so that's good I would say. Still, I think it deserves a bit more love. And now, we've reached the end of the video, and thank you for watching up until this point. As always, I hope you enjoyed, and don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll catch you in the next video, see ya.